I'm going to talk to you about my early days as a sailor. How did it all come about? People are always asking me, how did you start? Well, I didn't start as an infant, actually, because nobody in my family had ever been sailing. But my dad, who turned out to be the key man, had been stroke of his college boat at Cambridge. And he loved boats. He rather thought he liked the sea as well, but he wasn't sure about that. But he loved boats. And he always took me rowing when I was a little boy and we went on, hot, on, on holiday. We used to go on holiday to the Isle of Man, to Port Erin. And we used to go down to the little harbour in the evening after we'd had our tea. And he'd hire a rowing boat. And they were lovely rowing boats in those days. Beautiful skiffs, clinker built with a nice seat in the stern. And he'd row because he loved to row. And I used to watch him row. And if it was a calm evening, he'd feather the blades just floating along the top of the water and then pop them in and row some more. And if it was rough, he'd do what he called a racing feather. And he'd brought them out of the water, squared them, pulled them down, in and on we went. And my job was to sit in the stern and catch mackerel. And that's what I did, and we used to pull them in every night. We had great times, me and my dad, and we'd take them back and we'd, uh, we'd gut them, and we'd hand them in to the little guest house where we stayed, and they'd cook them for breakfast, and we had fresh mackerel for our breakfast every day. And that was my first experience of the sea and boating, really, with my dear old dad. And as I got a little bit older, he realised that He'd never had a chance to go adventuring and go on the sea because he was born in industrial Lancashire to a fairly lowly background. Uh, he did very well at school and got a scholarship to Cambridge, got on with his life, did quite well. And then the war came and knocked him back. He served in the RAF uh, and then started again after the war, had to make ends meet. Wasn't easy for people in the 1950s, but he managed it and he brought me and my sister up. And he never, ever did get to really go away and go adventuring and he never got to go sailing which was a great shame, but he encouraged me to do the same. Funnily enough, he encouraged me to, to go out on the sea. And he fed me books when I was a little boy. Um, the first book I ever read about this sort of thing was Joshua Slocum, Sailing Alone Around the World. I think I read that when I was 12, because my dad came along and said, here, have a read of this, son, see what you think of this. So I did, and I thought a lot of that. I thought that was great. And then more books came my way. And then, when I was 14, the big breakthrough happened. I don't know what really possessed him to do this, but me and my little mate Martin, who lived around the corner, we were getting on with it. We were young teenagers doing the things teenagers do, playing football in the street in those days and generally getting under people's feet. And I think his dad and my dad decided it would do us good to have some responsibility. And they wrote to a firm in Norfolk who hired yachts out, sailing yachts. And they persuaded these people to let me and my mate Martin go and hire one of these boats and we knew nothing. And I don't know whether they lied about our age or what happened, but uh, I really can't remember. But this is years ago. This is 1961. And uh, they put us on the train in Stockport at, at Easter. And there was that great big viaduct going across the town. What a, what a scene it was in those days. Uh, there were still trams and all sorts of things. And, and, and uh, they put us on the train at Edgeley Station. And off we went to Norfolk, just the two of us. And all we had was rucksacks with our kit in, and we had a book by a man called Peter Heaton that said, Teach Yourself Sailing, or something like that, on the cover. And that was it. That was our guide. And we had to read this book. And uh, we turned up at the boatyard, and the guys said, I don't know what they made of us. I really don't. But somehow they let us have the boat. And, well... We slept on the boat that first night, and it was a bit of an adventure. You pushed the cabin roof up on those little boats, because they were very shoal draft on the Norfolk Broads, because they only probably drew two or three feet, and yet they sailed remarkably well. Uh, all wooden boats, of course, in those days. And we had a good night on board, and in the morning we got up to go sailing. We got up real early, because we didn't want the people in the yard to see what utter numpties we were. And um, we did what it said in the book. We tied the bow of the boat to the bank, and let the stern come away because the wind fortuitously was blowing off the bank and we were head to wind and it said you had to do that to hoist the sails and interestingly on a Norfolk Broads boat the first sail you hoist is the jib not the mainsail all the way around on seagoing boats isn't it but on those boats you put the jib up first and I think the reason was because that enabled you to get the luff very tight and then when you pulled the main on it got even tighter because these jibs were set flying they weren't hanged on to anything so um you needed a tight luff. Anyway, um, my job on this jib hoisting session was to shackle the tack 
onto the little eye on the stem head of the boat. And I got the little shackle and I started winding it up and, and my fingers slipped and I dropped the shackle over the side. Well, there wasn't a spare shackle on board and we thought, well, it's only a little sail, that jib. It probably doesn't do much. We'll manage without. We'll go off with this big mainsail. That'll be OK. Little did we know. But anyway, that's what we did, because there was no way we were going to go and see that man in the yard and confess to him that we'd dropped the shackle over the side and ask him for another. So up went the mainsail and I was amazed at how enormous it was. I'd never been on a boat before, you see, and if, uh, if you're sailing with people who haven't been sailing, it's worth telling them that when the sail goes up, it's going to look enormous from underneath. They look quite normal when you're looking at other boats sailing along, but when you're on one of your own and you look up, blimey, it's enormous. So up it went, and it was blowing hard. I think it was blowing about four six, and um, the sail crackled and banged, and it was canvas sail, but it was banging around and making a tremendous amount of noise. And I was shocked at the amount of noise and the drama of all this, because I'd got no idea it was going to be like that. Um, we'd let the main sheet off slack, like it said in Peter Heaton's book, and the boom was banging around, and it was, it was quite dangerous, really. But it said, in the book, it said, when you're ready, cast off the bow and push the boat round so that it's facing the way you want to go. Well, we wanted to go down the river towards Yarmouth, and so that's what we did. We pushed the bow off, the bow fell away from the wind, the mainsail, which fortuitously, again, by pure good luck, we had all this main sheet out. We didn't have to have all that much out if we'd known better, but we did. And therefore, the boat was able to bear away nicely. And she bore right away until she was on what is effectively a, a beam reach. The mainsail filled and, and off we went. And we'd studied the book so we knew the tiller was going to work backwards. And we had a bit of a drama with that initially, but we soon sorted it out. And I realised that we were just tearing away down this river at great speed and there was a bow wave coming out and the reeds were bowing in the wind and the boat had gone quiet. She was completely silent and she was just ripping along through the water and I had the tiller in my hand and I felt that magical thing which is the conversion of flowing air into forward motion under your own hand on the tiller as you put that bit of weather helm on and keep her going straight. What a moment and do you know from that moment I never really wanted to do anything else. We had a great week on the broads and we came home, cock a hoop, our dance I think must have been pleased because we hadn't done any irreparable damage to the boat, he didn't get a rude letter from the boatyard man and uh, so they paid again and we went again in the autumn and we did that twice a year until we left school both of us and went to our separate universities and went our separate ways, haven't seen each other for years. We both read law at university. I, as you'll hear, ran away to sea. Martin did very well and became a, became a professor of law at, uh, I think, Oxford. And uh, we're still in touch and it's just great to see him after all this time because we were 50 years since we saw each other. But uh, that's how life goes, isn't it? But anyway, um, I went to university and at university I thought, oh, I'd better join the sailing club. So I did. Uh, and I thought I knew how to sail. Because I'd had, well, I don't know, eight weeks sailing on this boat when I was skipper of my own boat. I thought, I oh, know, I'll show these guys a thing or two. And of course, I'd never been to a sailing club. I'd never raced a dinghy. Actually, what I knew was totally self-taught. You could write it on the back of a postage stamp. They had big stamps in those days because you could have written it all on. And um, I got in a dinghy and promptly capsized. Well, they were very kind to me and they showed me how to do it. And they showed me how to sail it to windward. And I learned fast. And... All through university, I spent far too much time on those dinghies, those firefly dinghies, and not nearly enough studying the law, I'm afraid. And in my final holiday at university, um, you could go to America in those days with the British University's North America Club. You paid 50 quid and they put you on a Boeing 707 Pan Am Airways and off you went to America and you got free drink on the way. It was absolutely fantastic. I don't know what the girls' stewardesses made of us a lot, but uh, we had a whale of a time. And they poured us off the aeroplane in New York. And uh, in those days, nobody checked up on you very much. I had a fiver. I had five quid. That was all. And um, I had to look after myself. Well, I got a job uh, doing various simple things, washing up and cleaning out some, some old bunkhouses and things like that. But uh, at the weekend, I used to hitchhike and go and see what I could find. And I hitchhiked one weekend. I hitchhiked to Cape Cod from Boston. And I was on my way down the road and, um, and a girl stopped in a great big Buick convertible. Wow, I thought, my luck's in here. And there was three girls in this car and I hopped in and they were taken with me because of my English accent, of course. I was a bit of a curio, I suppose. And, um, and off we went and they were going to Cape Cod. And we went to Cape Cod with them 
And they looked after me. I had two or three days with them and had a whale of a time. But uh, on the third day, we went down to the waterfront and I saw a magnificent sight. I saw a wonderful schooner, a big schooner, 70 feet or something, sailing along out at sea and coming in towards the wharf. And I thought, wow, look at that. I'd never seen anything so lovely. And I thought I'd like to get a job on there if I could. And um, that evening, I walked down the dock and I found the skipper, who was an elderly gentleman, who had worked on the Grand Banks in his youth. He'd been a dorryman on the banks, this guy, he was Portuguese. And, and he, he was a Portuguese extraction. And he said, I'll take you on, boy. I'll give you a couple of months work, see how you get on. If it works, you can stay. If it doesn't, you can walk down the dock again. And I went and I learned from him. And at the end of the summer, I'd learned so much. And I'd learned that I could be paid for going sailing. I thought, why am I bothering? Why do I go back to university and study law? No, this is the end of it. I've wanted to sail ever since that day on the Norfolk Broads. This has shown me that it can be done. I bought myself a US Navy pea jacket. I hopped on the Boeing 707 and went back to Britain. I had a difficult conversation with my dad, but I think he understood. And I went to sea. The rest, as you might say, is history. <laughs>